Welcome to Bad Influence, the place where you can always see the latest and best hardware and software like this. The most powerful, most expensive, noisiest computer we've ever had in the studio. A computer capable of graphics like these. Our main review is Jungle Book on the Game Gear. And now be reporting from the first ever virtual reality arena, the other side. But first, a new piece of software that the bosses of Euro Disney could have done with. It's a do-it-yourself amusement park kit. Now the idea is you start off with an empty field and you have to use that site to build the most profitable theme park in the world. So we go to this panel of icons at the side here and choose the ride icon. You click on that and get all the choices. There are loads to choose from, plane flyer, race car ride, merry-go-round, that's a good one, that's a teacup ride, so I'm going to choose that, that's one of my favourites. And you just place it where you want it. And then you have to place the entrance and the exit so that people can come to and from it easily. Now, up here there's another empty space. And here I'm going to put a shop. So I go to the panel of icons again, choose the shop, and get Mr Wimpy Ices, Big Time Fries, Balloon World, that sounds good, they can all have balloons, that can make them happy. Click that there and there it is. So far, so simple, but actually it does get quite complicated. I'll take you on a tour of the park and show you. Uh, if we go up here, I'll show you my fantastic roller coaster, which was, in fact, working earlier on, but it broke down, and I put this maintenance man in the corner here on to fix it, but he's just spent so long having his tea break that it's still broken down. You can't get the staff when you're running a theme park. Over here, um, oh, this is my haunted house. That's going quite nicely. The punters are queuing up madly, but one of the best things about the game is that all the people have a mind of their own and there's sort of a knock-on effect. For example, if you don't maintain your park properly, hordes of bikers will turn up, vandalise your rides and beat up your punters. In the final version, there'll be speech and in the planned 3DO version, there'll be a special feature where you can click on a character just before they're going on a ride and then you can see that ride experience through their eyes. This is a graphical mock-up of the roller coaster. Theme Park is definitely one to look out for. Potions! I've been developing potions to help with the cheats. Now, today's first cheat is absolutely amazing, but it's very long. So, I'm going to use the potion N fast to help me get through it quickly enough. Oh. It's full. Ayrton Senna's Monaco Grand Prix 2 on the Mega Drive. It lets you turn a car into a bike. Here it goes. Enter the World Championship race. Then select New Game and select Beginner. Enter the name as Hang On! Exclamation mark with a dash in the middle. Then select End. Then start the race and retire. Then start the race again and retire again. And then on the driver's point racing table, save the round on number six. Then reset the Mega Drive. Phew. <laughs> then go to free practice and select a track. Then press down and A together, like so, and select image training, like so. Then press down and A together again until the game comes up. And you'll be able to play it on a bike instead of a car. Brilliant! Uh, now for the antidote. Oh, oh no! The end snail! It's gone missing! Uh, uh, uh. Slow down, man. Jungle Book is the latest Disney film to get the video game treatment. Mowgli's leap to the small screen starts with the Game Gear, with Master System and Mega Drive to come later. The plot of the video game is very close to the plot of the film, so here, following in the footsteps of the man cub, is Adam. Yes, it's another film like that, and yes, they've turned it into another platform game. But unlike in the film, Mowgli gets to kill things. The graphics are drawn pretty nicely here in a Disney style, although a couple of them don't animate too well, like the crocodile. The Mowgli sprite's okay, and so are most of the enemies. It plays music from the film, although because the Game Gear can't handle sounds too well, they don't sound wonderful, but they can't really be blamed for that. This is the Falling Ruin stage, where there's quite a nice graphic effect of shaking the screen when the rockets the floor. It's one of the best stages of the game, with a more well-defined background and a bit more thought put into the actual gameplay. Here I'm supposed to be looking for gems which will let you escape to the next level. And every time you step on one of these platforms, it just crumbles underneath you. So if you mash up one time, you're dead. And that's it. The snakes that are right there, they help you spring about and jump to places where you wouldn't ordinarily be able to go. This is a King Louis II stage with a King of the Swingers tune from the film. This is just basically another end of level boss sequence like you'd find in quite a few games which doesn't seem to apply to Jungle Book too well, but at least the character sprite does look like what it's supposed to be. Warning to parents buying this for their kids at Christmas. It's not a cute game with no violence in it. It's a cute game with lots of violence in it. A great game with great music and graphics for the Game Gear. I didn't like the gameplay, and it's not true to the film. It's disappointing for such a big title. And so the final scores for Jungle Book, both the girls and the boys gave it an above average four out of five. 
This is a cyberpunk's paradise, a techno cathedral filled with the hottest VR rides in the world. It's called The Other Side, and it's here at the Boston World Trade Center, and I just can't wait to get online. Using blue screen and computers together, I can actually be part of the game. The computer can tell where the edge of my body is on the screen. So where the images meet, I can interact with the picture and create new games. Neat. Hit the Arc Star. Power up. Engage. Freeze yourself. This is the public debut of this experience called Freedom 6. I'm in a motion-based theater, and I'm pursuing an intruder through a city of the future. The film is on a continuous loop while this computer controls the hydraulic seating, matching the movements with the action, frame by frame. This ride takes all the ingredients of other simulators and adds an extra ingredient. G-Force to make the experience as realistic as possible. Inside, I'm going to be driving an Indy car, which is a very fast racer. See you later. I can do over 200 miles an hour and pull 1.7 Gs, which is as much as most bodies can safely stand without risk. The wheel is very sensitive. I've seen so many varieties of reality today, I don't even know if this is really me. The confused Z right in Boston. The other side's now in mothballs until the spring when it's touring the states. Now for this week's news and previews. Watch out for 620,000 tons of meteors as you take the controls of Stardust for the Amiga. In this cosmic shoot em up you pilot an intergalactic spaceship in your attempt to save the galaxy. It's a kind of 90s version of the classic arcade game Asteroids brought right up to date. Available from a space station near you in December. In keeping with this week's weather, here's a first look at Winter Olympics. It features 10 sports and up to four players can play in turns. In the Mega Drive version, there are two head-to-heads where you can speed skate or ski slalom on the same screen. All versions are out next month before the real thing starts at Dillehammer in Norway in February. Skyblazer for the snares is due out early next year. This is an early version of the game which stars Sky, a young warrior whose true love has been kidnapped by an unspeakable entity from the netherworld. You'll have spotted by now that it's a platform beat him up and our hero Sky picks up new skills every couple of levels. More future fun with Cyber Race out of the PC next month. Players lock joysticks with underground racing gangs and tear across planet surfaces, dodging obstacles and fire from other ships. With a huge adventure subplot, sample speech, tons of ship upgrades, this will be a biggie. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> oh no! I thought that was the antidote, but it's actually enlarged! Oh. Oh. Well, at least it stopped the end fast. This next cheat is for Battletoads on the SNES. Ugh. On the zit, rash and pimple screen, simply hold down down A and B and press start and you'll get five lives and five continues. Hey, now I need to drink the end small. Ah, there we go. Whoa! Whoa! Oh no, the end small, it wasn't diluted. Nam Rude, small but perfectly formed. There's an American computer company whose name you probably don't know, but whose work you'll certainly have seen. Their machines are responsible for the stunning computer graphics seen in movies like Jurassic Park and Terminator 2. The latest virtual reality simulators look so good because of the speed and power of this company's hardware. And with Nintendo, they're now working on a home machine that should be ready in two years' time. The company's name? Silicon Graphics. And whilst nobody knows anything about the home machine, this is what their professional models can do. All these images were produced on one of their most powerful workstations, the funkily named Onyx Reality Engine 2. And today, at great expense, it's here in the Bad Influence studio. 
you want one of these for Christmas, it will cost you a cool quarter of a million pounds. So I better not spill any yoghurt on it. It produces images four times the quality of your normal TV picture, so I'm seeing much crisper pictures than you are. And astonishingly, all these images are happening in real time. The computer's having to do millions of calculations a second to work out what each part of the picture should look like as we move round it. We can zoom in and out, we can spin it to the left and to the right. It's calculating the way the light is reflected, how the shadows fall. In fact, the calculating power of the Reality Engine 2 is 200 times that of a PC. And it can produce pictures like this so quickly because it uses a technique called texture mapping. That's a phrase you've heard on the program before, but I'm going to try and explain what texture mapping is now. But to do that, we've just got to get rid of our space station. And a fellow you might recognize, Ludwig van Beethoven, albeit a fairly basic model of him. There's a bit of shading on there, but not much else. What he needs is a bit of texture mapping. And the texture we're going to map onto him is that one, brick. The computer doesn't need much more information than that tiny portion of it because it can just reproduce it as many times as is necessary. So we'll ask it to map that texture onto Beethoven. And there he is, Ludwig van Beethoven, texture mapped with brick. What the computer's done is taken the texture, which was the brick, and mapped it onto the model of Beethoven. Effectively, he's wrapped it round, like you would wrap a present for Christmas. And you can still move it around in real time. You can spin it and turn it upside down and see all the angles and all the shadows. You can do some cool tricks with this equipment as well, though. What we've done now is mapped a shiny surface onto Beethoven, and the computer's showing us what that would look like if it was put in front of a photograph of some flowers. It's calculating all the reflections as it rotates. It'll do the same as I move it up or down, or spin it. And you can use other photos too. See if you recognize these two. This time, Ludwig van Beethoven is in front of a photograph of the young and dashing presenting team of Bad Influence. Although which of us is young and which is dashing, I'll leave you to sort out for yourself. If we turn Beethoven around, and zoom in and in and in and go through the base of the bus, we can go right inside and then the reflections start to get really weird. There are other things you can do with photographs and texture mapping as well. I scanned in a photograph of Violet earlier on and watch, I can make it look like I've dropped a pebble into the pond, create a ripple effect, or better than that, I can stretch her nose, make her fingers longer or even rotates her hair. And to show you how texture mapping helps me do this, I'll just have to call up another photograph. Underneath this photograph is a grid, and there was the same grid underneath Violet's photograph. And if you want to distort the image, the computer calculates how the grid would be distorted, and each point on the photograph corresponds to a point on the grid. So all the computer has to do to figure out distortion is distort the grid and then just texture map the photograph over the distortion. It really is a very simple but very effective technique. You can also use texture mapping to create virtual worlds. All the images in this virtual town have been created by texture mapping. I should be on the right, it's America. Hang a left and make for that tree. Even the trees are being created by texture mapping. Look, if I turn the texture mapping off, you can see it's just a block or a two-dimensional billboard. And what the texture mapping does is put a photograph of the tree onto that block. And where there isn't a tree, it makes the block invisible. It really is very clever. It just maps it on in the same way as it mapped the brick and the shiny surfaces onto Beethoven. And the same applies to all the buildings. Look, without the texture mapping, they're just blocks. With the texture mapping, the detail is quite incredible. There's also a virtual lorry that drives around the village and you can look at it from different viewpoints. From here, which peculiarly is the front axle, or from outside the lorry like that, or from way up in the sky. Remember I told you the trees were texture mapped onto two-dimensional blocks? See how, as it passes the lorry, the billboard turns. If your point of view was in the lorry, that would just look like a tree all the way around. But from the air, you can see how the computer fools you. This kit costs a quarter of a million pounds, so obviously it does have some serious aspects too. Architects can produce very accurate walkthroughs of buildings that prospective customers can walk around and explore at will. This is a real building. It's the University of California in America. Designers can try out their ideas, see where they want the doors and windows to be, see if the whole building works as a whole. And my favorite demo as a bit of a sailor is this one, a harbor simulator for training boat captains. And now for some more games reviews. Cosmic Spacehead on the Mega Drive is a curious console game as it uses a mixture of styles. It's a kind of cartoony, point-and-clicky, adventure-y, platformy, puzzly, role-playing-y sort of game for the thingy. 
Anyway, Cosmic has to find his way to Earth from his home planet, Linoleum, and get some souvenirs to prove he's been. Here's Sarah. This is an adventure game where you have to work out a strategy to get Cosmic back to Earth. I'm in old Lino town now, and I'm going to go into the post office to get a passport. I can choose various actions that I want to do to get me to the next step, such as look, pick up, talk, give, or use. The controls are quite hard to use if you are not used to this sort of game. There are various other little games inside the overall game. In this platform level, we have to collect little sweets which help to get extra lives. If you're a patient person and like to puzzle things out, then this is your sort of game, but it's not really mine. Despite the cutesy graphics, it's not really for little kids, but if you like role-playing games, it'll make a nice change. This is a poor excuse for a role-playing game. The graphics are cute, but I didn't like it because it felt as if it should be controlled by a mouse rather than a joypad. And the scores for Cosmic Spacehead. The girls gave it a run of the mill, three out of five, and the boys gave it a poor two out of five. The ninja from the nth dimension is back. As in all good sequels, Zool's brought a friend, and she's called Zoos. The story so far is that the evil Cruel has sent his henchman mental block to wreak havoc on the nth. You start in Swan Lake, so here, girding his loins for some foul play, is Wayne. For those who have seen the original Zool, this may look terribly familiar. The main structure of the game is taken directly from the original, but with a few subtle changes. Here we see the new character, Zoos. She's a female ninja. Makes a change to see a female character doing something of any use, rather than waiting to be rescued. The graphics are really well drawn and the sound's very good, but unfortunately you can only have either the music or the sound effects on at once. Here I have to collect 99% of all the things on the screen to be able to finish the level. They've taken the easy option here. They could have made it radically different, but they've stuck with the winning formula. Don't buy it if you've already got Zool, though. I really like this game. The graphics are really good, and it's very playable. It's another platform game, but it's actually very good, even though it's very close to the original. And the scores for Zool 2. Both the boys and the girls gave it an excellent four out of five. Hello again, Bertlers. I've got one potion left that I call N-Visible. Right, here goes. Oh, it worked, it worked. Right, now time for my first invisible cheat. It's for Transbot on the Master System. First of all, plug in two controllers, then hold down buttons one and two and turn your console on. <laughs> now, wait for a secret command screen to appear. When it does, turn all the numbers onto on, like so, and then press start on controller two and start on controller one, and your ship will be Invisible! <laughs> oh, sorry, I mean invincible. <laughs> now for the antidote. Ah, yes. <laughs> oh, oh no! It's not worked! I'm gonna be like this forever! Andy! Violet! I hope he doesn't find the antidote. If you want to read the data blast that your video recorders now, last week's competition was to win a portable CD player and a jacket and CD from Last Action Hero and ten runners-up get banded to a T-shirt. We asked you in which Austrian town was Arnold Schwarzenegger born. The answer is Graz, and the lucky winner is Stephen Bowe from Folkestone. This week's competition prize is the Reality Engine 2. You wish. This week's competition prize is a Game Gear with the Jungle Book game, and the question is, who wrote the book on which the film Jungle Book was based? If you think you know, call us on 0891 700 100. The call will cost you no more than 25p, but do please get permission from whoever pays the bill before you dial. The lines will stay up until midnight on Monday. That's it for this week. See ya. Take care. Bye-bye.